So the largest cryptocurrency hack in history has just happened. And in this video, I wanna break down exactly what happened, the steps the attackers took, including the technologies that they used, and how this could have been prevented. Before we get into it, do me a quick favor. Like this video, subscribe to the channel. We're brand new, but we're trying to create great content for security and for devs. All right, enough about that, let's get into it. What exactly happened? Well. If you look in the media, you'll notice that there's a lot about the Bybit hack. Essentially, nearly $1.5 billion of cryptocurrency was stolen by North Korean Lazarus Hacking Group from Bybit's wallet. Now, you would be forgiven in thinking that Bybit itself got hacked, and I guess in some ways, yes, they did, but it was actually through a supply chain attack. The origin of this attack actually started with something called Safe wallet and specifically a developer <laughs> that works for safe wallet who's probably feeling awfully bad right about now so very quickly before we start i just want to explain exactly what safe wallet is because it's important to understand this story safe wallet is a decentralized custody protocol and essentially what this is is in cryptocurrency you need to store the assets the cryptocurrency itself inside what we call wallets these wallets usually have a key to them now the problem with traditional wallets is that if you lose this key or someone else gets it and attacker gets it well then all your money is gone instantly right well what safe wallet brought to the table was introducing a new protocol in which you needed multiple signatures to be able to access or transfer funds it made it more secure and what actually ended up happening is an attacker was able to compromise this protocol i'll explain exactly how in a minute and they used that to attack by bits wallets all right let's run through the exact steps that actually happened in this case as i said it all started with a developer now somehow this developer's accounts were compromised and in particular their accounts for a data storage solution. In this case, it was an Amazon S3 bucket. Now, this S3 bucket or this data storage was being used to store script files belonging to the safe wallet protocol. In this case, there was JavaScript files that were being called during the protocol. So when transfers were being made, this JavaScript files JavaScript files from this S3 bucket were being called. This is fairly normal, and this would have been distributed out in the deployment process. And what they were able to do is take one of these scripts, which was a JavaScript uh, file, and turn it malicious. What that meant is that every time a transfer was being made, this script, which was now malicious, was being run. Now, this is what we call a supply chain attack. And supply chain attacks often happen like this. You can relate to the Circle CI supply chain attack, which also was compromised via developer credentials. What's really interesting here is that the attackers were very targeted at Bybit's wallets. We know this because as I'm gonna go through the code, they were only targeting their wallets. And what ended up happening is this script essentially created a backdoor in the supply chain, but it only ran if a transfer was involving Bybit's wallets, one of two of the wallets that were targeted in this account. For everyone else, they wouldn't have known, and this backdoor remains dormant. The attackers didn't just steal cryptocurrency willy-nilly. No, they were targeted on their prize. What ended up happening next is that Bybit actually went to make a transfer via the safe wallet protocol. In this case, it was for 30,000 Ethereum, a fairly standard protocol, and it was signed by three uh, authorized members of Bybit, including their CEO. Now, because this was involving a wallet that the attackers knew about and were targeting, the malicious script was then triggered. Now, you may think that this malicious script did something like change the addresses so that the uh, instead of sending it to wallet A, it sent it to the attacker's wallet, wallet B. No, no, no. The attackers were much more sophisticated than that, and they did something really quite amazing. Here's what they did. Now, this is going to get a tiny bit technical and into some jargon, but it should make sense in the end. Essentially, what the attackers were able to do is when this transfer was made, the malicious JavaScript ran and it updated by bits contract. Now, they were using something called a Genesis safe proxy contract. Now, and this is kind of important. What ended up happening is this proxy contract contains the most minimal amount of information possible, but it delegates tasks or it connects to a master contract. And that master contract contains much more information. And the contract is all about what's meant to happen when transfers are made. What the attackers were able to do is change the address in the proxy contract, the smaller contract, 
And instead of kind of delegating tasks to the master contract, they delegated tasks to their own malicious contract that they had created three days earlier. What this all means is that the attackers didn't just hijack that one transfer. They hijacked the entire wallet. They did this by putting in a backdoor through that contract. Now I'm gonna show you that exact backdoor. I'm gonna show you the code for it. But what you can do is you can think about it like this. You have a contract, just a normal contract on paper and three people need to sign it. Now in that contract, it says to refer to Appendix A. But at the last minute, someone changes that to Appendix B. But the rest of the contract all stays the same, so it doesn't look that malicious. The problem is that Appendix B is controlled by bad guys, by the attackers. And they update it and say, hey, give us all your money. That's essentially what happened. They created their own contract, it created a backdoor into their wallet, and they were able to steal it. From there, the attackers then transferred that money into multiple different wallets, 36 different wallets, and this is to obfuscure the next step, which is them trying to convert that cryptocurrency into fiat currency or kind of USD or euros or something like that. So let's go through those steps and look at some of the technical details. Let's look at the actual exploits that the attackers did. So we can do this by going to the Safe Global website. And if we inspect this page, we can actually see some of the assets that are being used. So if we go to sources and we scroll down, we can actually see under pages, this here file. Now this JavaScript file is the actual JavaScript file, we can pull it out here, that the attackers managed to turn malicious. And what is interesting about this, this isn't here on my screen, isn't the malicious version. This is the benign version, but this is how they do it. This is being called from that bucket, that S3 bucket that was turned malicious. Now using Wayback Machine, using the archives, we can actually see the malicious version. Now, this all looks like gobbledygook. Yes, we could format this nicely and have a look through it, but something so much better has happened for it, and I cannot understate my excitement for this. This report from Verichains has been made public. And this actually goes through in great detail a lot of the timelines and the actual uh, information about it. And here it also contains the code that was used in the attack. But there's something even more. They have the raw code. And yes, we can look through this and try and decipher what's happened. But the Verichains has done something unbelievable. And what they have done is they have rewritten this <laughs> in an in easy to read format with comments so that regular old Joes like me can actually look at this code and understand what's happening. And we can see that kind of here. Here are the targets of safe addresses. Remember I said that it specifically targeted Bybit. These are the Bybit wallets that it was specifically targeting. So we can see that that's here. Here we have the attacker's wallet to receive the funds. And down here we have the attacker's payload. Now we can actually decrypt this payload, but essentially what it is saying is this is where it's saying at storage point zero in the contract, which is where the connection to the master contract is stored, uh, it's saying to update it. And using this report, we can actually look at the malicious contract that they created. So here, using the ether scan, we can uh, decompile this and actually have a look at the malicious contract of what it was happening. And, and here we can see that in this malicious contract, they are actually transferring all of the money from that wallet into the attacker's wallet. So this here is really interesting. And of course, the final part of that, we can actually see the transaction itself. So here we can see this transaction and we can see that 401,346 Ethereum has been transferred from Cold Wallet Storage 1 to Bybit Explorer. And then once we get into the Bybit Explorer wallet, we can actually see all of the places uh, that uh, money has been transferred to. And as you can see, if we look into the transaction history of this, then there's been 4,381 transactions and there are an awful lot of transactions coming from this wallet, Bybit Exploiter. If you want to find out more about this incident and go into details, I have links to that report in the in the comments below. So if you want to get into the nitty gritty of it a little bit more then you can. So let's talk a bit quickly about what's next. So this is actually a really interesting part of this exploit. And the, the hackers have the money 
but they haven't managed to convert it into fiat currency as of yet. Well, at least not all of it. This isn't actually the first time that the North Koreans have able to been able to do such a heist. They were actually able to steal a billion dollars from Bangladesh National Bank uh, earlier. However, because it is very hard to transfer stolen money into hard fiat money, they were only able to get $81 million. And now we have the same cat and mouse game happening. What has happened is this has gone into huge amounts of different wallets to try and obfuscate it. And the attackers will be rapidly trying to transfer this money into fiat currency. But to do that, they need to go on to regular exchanges often are regulated. Now, what the defenders are trying to do is find out the wallets of exchanges that these are going into. They can then contact the exchange, the exchange can freeze the money, and hopefully it gets back to Bybit. But this is a big cat and mouse game, and the attackers here are very sophisticated. What's really interesting about these attackers is that we actually know who they are. Like, their faces and their names. So we know that this is from North Korean and the Lazarus group. And we also know the core ringleaders. Now, the main ringleader from the Lazarus good is Park Yun Hyuk. Now, sorry, Park, if you're watching my video and I mispronounced your name. But Park is pretty well known as one of the best hackers in the world. And he's the head of the Lazarus group. And we also know three other hackers that were involved in this. Kim Il and Jong Chang Hyuk. So these are the three North Koreans that are largely behind the Lazarus group. Obviously, there's a lot more. But these are the ones that we know are currently trying to get this money out. So it's kind of interesting that we even know who these people are. We know where that money is, but we just can't get it. And this such is the challenge with cryptocurrency. All right, let's have a little talk about what could have prevented this. Now... It's always great in hindsight. Everyone can look at a breach when it happens and, and they can see how, how it all unfolded. Like this all unfolded because someone lost their credentials. And I'm about to say some ways of which we could have, well, at least one core way of which we could have prevented this. But I mean, it's all very well to say after a breach. But there is something that we all should do as developers that could prevent this type of poisoning attack. And what that is, is called sub-resource integrity checks. So how does a sub-resource integrity check actually work? Well, I'm so glad you asked. How resource checking works is essentially we create something called a hash or a sha of a file. And what that is, is it's basically several numbers which is created with only that specific uh, version of the file. If we change one character in there, we make one letter capital, the entire SHA or the entire hash changes. What this means is that we can take this number and we can compare it. We can say, this is what I'm expecting. This is the unadulterated document. If it matches this SHA, it's what I'm expecting. If it doesn't match this SHA, then it's not what I'm expecting and it's been altered maliciously. Now, this is actually a really important part. The reason why we don't use sub-resource uh, integrity checks is because we need to involve that during our deployment process. That can be quite hard because every time we deploy our application, we also need to deploy a subset of SHAs or hashes along with every resource that we call to make sure that we can check that it's the same. And that's essentially what didn't happen. Had sub-resources integrity checks been used in this case, what we would have discovered is that the JavaScript file we were expecting and the JavaScript file that we were delivered were not the same. This doesn't make the attack two times harder. It makes it a thousand times harder. And this is because now the attackers don't only need to compromise one system, they compromise the S3 buckets. Now they need to compromise multiple systems because they need to change the SHA values in what we're expecting. And that becomes a magnet of, of order much more difficult. So that's how this kind of attack could have been prevented. Sub-resource integrity checks. Now, if you're not using these as a developer, you absolutely should be using these. It's worthwhile, especially if you're dealing with cryptocurrency, maybe that's a good idea. No shade on Safe Wallet. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video. That is my recount of the Bybit attack. Please let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this. If you want me to do similar videos for other attacks in the future, I hope you had fun. I had fun making it. And until the next video, I'll see you. Oh, yeah, and do the subscribe, like thing before I forget. Thanks.